much more conservative place in the 70s and early 80s. The average parent of a kid going to private school, if they had money, they voted for Reagan. The average working class white parent voted for John Barbagelato, who ran for mayor against Moscone, and certainly for Reagan. Among the non-white population, yes, the votes went the other way, and it was a more progressive thing, and there were pockets of progressive politics, but there was a strong conservative presence. I like the Bay Area, Berkeley, you know, my whole politics. Because I got rubbed wrong in the Navy, I had a real axe to grind because I felt like they cheated me. And I was pretty angry about the whole thing. And when you're young and angry, it goes a long way. At the time, I didn't. I don't think I realized that the Bay Area was such a bubble, you know, social bubble that it is. But I just kind of figured it was like that everywhere. San Francisco had been a big music scene in the '60s, in the psychedelic days of the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and Moby Grape and all these bands that became very, very important in terms of an underground music scene that just exploded nationally. So then, when the idealism of that kind of music and the political environment that the music existed in, when that sort of started to change and become a little bit more commercialized, San Francisco sort of died as a scene. Punk rock, including San Francisco, grew out of the kind of physical fallout of the collapse of manufacturing in urban centers, right? The physical infrastructural fallout. Buildings being abandoned, jobs disappeared good working class jobs that people had fought for. So it is, the economy is really important. And that story never gets told about San Francisco. It's always about New York, Chicago, Detroit, but it happened in San Francisco too. When I got out of the Navy, I started pursuing my uh, career as an artist and I started submitting my work to try to get accepted in various schools. And the one that finally panned out was in, in Oakland, California, California School of the Arts. So I met Joe in college. And around 1974, things really started to blossom in the art world. The NEA was giving a lot of grant money to uh, people with good proposals for alternative art spaces. And so there'd be performance art, installation art, concept art, sound art. And it was all done really well. This whole thing with punk wasn't on fire yet, you know. It started out with performance art pieces, and there were certain people that I really admired, and it was very intense kind of things. I mean, you know, they're using body fluids and crawling around naked on the floor through razor blades and people shooting themselves, you know, just to, to carry on the performance piece. There was a statement being made. And I mean, this was heavy duty. All right, those are the people that attracted me. That's when Christo did his running fence that went from Marin to Sonoma County. It was 24 miles long. And Joe actually hired a plane and did a film from Aerial Bird's Eye View. And that was a really amazing, amazing experience. See, what video did, which was simple, but this was the mind-blowing thing. You could see what you had done just a half hour ago. And it gave you an incredible advantage to correction, to creating because you can make changes. And you started to be able to control time. He had this huge, huge, huge camera, which no one could have possibly ever afforded back then. These things were ginormous and heavy, and you could only shoot 20 minutes on a tape or something. There were definitely restrictions, and they were just so big. We started going out to the clubs and filming live in mm -hmm. black and white. And so you just pack up your gear and drive out to the club. And, and we managed to make it all work because we didn't know how easy it was going to get. We knew it was faster than film. And we're going to put this thing together. It's right here. We shot this yesterday. We can put it out today. I met Joe from Vail, I think. Vail invited me over to his house, I think it was 78, to watch uh, Target videos, because Joe had his own TV show. And that was another thing. I mean, it was like fucking punks had their own fucking, they had their own fucking TV show, and Joe had like real equipment, like 
that a TV station would have. I mean, it was like, you know, like that was just unbelievable. I mean, it really made you feel like you had invested in the right direction when you saw like how fast it was growing and all of the capabilities that all these people had that, you know, were the people that made up the underground in San Francisco. And it really made you want to be part of it and really made me want to contribute to it. I, I say first technology, then culture. We did performance pieces and the video, it was just kind of a natural progression, it seemed like, of the uh, performance art that we did in school, but kind of making it, the band will be the performance piece now. San Francisco was really in a transition period, so there was all these venues, and the people just couldn't say no here. You know, like the, that they would let all these punk shows happen in the Jim Jones things after the massacre. You know, of course, you know, why not? You know, nobody had any sense of propriety or like why they shouldn't do this or why they shouldn't do that. They were like, yeah. You know, I don't think I thought of it as chaotic. I just thought that's how things are. I remember, you know, Jim Jones, that was pretty early on when we performed at Temple Beautiful, uh, almost kitty corner, but on the same block, was People's Temple. And we would look and go, wow, there's People's Temple. You know, that's that's where Jim Jones was. I don't, it, it just seemed like this is the way things are to me. It didn't seem like it was anything out of the ordinary. At a punk rock show, you weren't sitting there like you were at a, you know, an opera or a symphony. You were part of the show. And there were few bands where that was more true than the mutants. You know, you might want to call them performance art, but people would get up on the stage and jump around when they were playing. <laughs> I, don't, I, I mean, they were drunk and having fun. And that was the thing about a mutant show. Everyone who went to a mutant show had a good time. That was the reason why I decided to bring them to Napa State. I thought the Cramps would be a great band for this particular venue and that the Mutants would be a great band. And I thought, you know, uh, this was going to be a lot of fun. Okay, the Cramps at the Napa State Mental Facility. To this day, out of all the videos I've done, I have gotten more feedback, and I mean literally thousands of people have commented about that black and white tape. My name is Alan Gill. I worked as a psychiatric technician at Napa State Hospital in the 70s and the 80s. At that time, people could commit themselves, which you can no longer do. That was taken away years ago. So a lot of the population you have at state hospitals were actually self-committed. There are people that just could not make it, and they needed somewhere safe and for someone to take care of them. And they obviously had psychiatric disorders. We were really interested in playing non-traditional spaces, anything outside the box, it was kind of more interesting than just sticking to, like, say, a nightclub or a rock venue. That's probably my favorite punk show ever, was the Cramps at Napa. It was just so much fun. It's because it was so hot, too. We're not used to being in the daytime, in the sun, <laughs> together. We only saw each other at night. Joe was always very game to do anything, very enthusiastic. And Joe had the skills to set these kind of things up and how he climbed it, too. I mean, they could organize things with places like prisons or mental hospitals or schools. I can remember some of the details, and they could be wrong. This is one possibility. The cramps were supposed to play... Maybe the Mabuhe, but something happened, and they asked me, what are they going to do? And I wound up setting this thing up at Napa State. I don't remember the business details. I don't remember if people got paid. I mean, obviously, 
No one is thinking, oh, wow, let's play Napa State. We can sell a bunch of records. I mean, that wasn't going to happen. This was just, let's go and have some fun, which we did. We drove up with the mutants, and we walked right into, what was a courtyard? It was like a one-story building with a courtyard. I don't remember any security entrance or anybody checking us or asking for ID, nothing like that. It was an event. It was going on. We were there to film it. We were there to be there. We just got there, and you could wander around. But I'll tell you this, there wasn't anything you could go to very close, like a store or a town or something. I mean, you'd have to walk a long ways. It really is out in the sticks. Napa State Hospital, Stockton State Hospital, Fairview, Ag News, all of them had their own farms. And they raised their own cattle, they raised chickens, they were processing their own food. That's why they had those huge institutional kitchens. People made textiles, manufactured their own clothing, they made clothing for the prison system, and everybody went to work. Everybody crossed the street and went to work every day. That was part of the model. Not a lot of rules. We weren't supposed to uh, show anyone's name, but how would you do that? You know, there wasn't supposed to be any documentation on who's who, but there wasn't much, no. During this time, when the cramps were there, I remember distinctly I was working this particular unit, which was strictly clients who were too mentally ill to stand trial and were a danger to themselves and or to others. On that unit, there was a profession called recreational therapist. This thing happened where I had just come into work and the rec therapist just came to me and said, hey, let's take all these guys over to the gym. They're supposed to have a band. So that's what we did. Who would have ever thought this would happen? Playing a mental hospital, a punk show. This was really unusual. I do remember occasionally, you know, it might be a parent or family member that's musical would come and do a small concert, say on an individual living unit, something like that. But nothing like this. No, nothing like this. What a cramp! And we're from New York City. And we drove 3,000 miles to play for you people. And somebody told me you people are crazy. But I'm not so sure about that. You seem to be all right with me. The way I walk is just the way I walk. They opened the doors from the facility and they just kind of came out, stumbled around. Once the music started, they stared at it for about the first five, ten minutes. And then they decided, hey, this is for me. So they started participating, interacting. I mean, people would grab the microphone and try to... And some guys got up on stage, you can see in the video, where he was trying to mimic the... It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I mean, you don't know who's who in that video. There's, you know, the band members and the mental patients are the same. These people didn't seem alienated or stressed at all. Just mostly curious, and then when they figured out that it was an empathetic situation, Ruby just had a great time. There was a group of people there had taken LSD, and that's just part of the folklore, and it's true. When we all took you know, LSD, as usual, any excuse. Now, I'm not speaking for the cramp, okay? And I'm not speaking for everybody in my band, but, you know, I can speak for myself and my friends. Hence, a lot of people don't remember much. So, everyone was laughing a lot and intermingling with the patients of the hospital and everyone was wearing crazy clothes. There was a lot of pushback from the administration because at that time it's a state job. So administrators obviously are the older folk, the suit and tie gang, and they were not at all pleased. Most of the staff that I worked with, we were all long hair, bearded hippies. You know, what kind of person goes to work at a state hospital? We were kind of, you know, peace, love, freedom, and be good to each other. So being a caregiver came pretty easily. And so it was surprising, with that amount of resistance, that something like this happening, and I think there, there might have even been disciplinary action taken against uh, some rec therapists or something like that. I don't really remember. But it, it did cause a bit of a row. 
Yeah. Yeah. Loved the band. It was such a small little stage that the the uh, patients and the guests could just walk up the steps and join in with the band if they wanted. It was just like an inclusive situation where the audience and the band were kind of one. It was just such a nice kind of fun day, and you know everybody likes a bit of entertainment. I like the crowd so far, honey. I got plans. What am I gonna do about it? I don't know. That's your problem, honey. I got them myself. Yeah. And I can't do anything with them either. Reagan did is that was the model that he decided to destroy, because he wanted to privatize everything, and what he had his eye on was clothing and food service to be able to sell contracts to private contractors. So rather than state hospitals being self-sustaining, actually being their own towns, Reagan wanted to sell the land, which he did, and then they closed the farms. Food service went to private contracting, and that's when they started to have to eat really. Shitty food, and then they contracted out clothing, and all of these institutional clothing companies took over and started selling clothes to the state. So they took away all those jobs, and folks worked those jobs for ten, fifteen, twenty years. You know that was their life. It was the safest world for them to live in, and、uh, we took that all away and we locked them up. We put them in a smaller area, and that was his model. You know, they were kind of like the people that were just discarded and. They were so overwhelmed by someone even caring to put on a show, and they got so into it. You have to understand, you know,、uh, psychiatric patients' their、uh, boundaries are challenging, so they're not necessarily going to respect you being up on a stage. They'll just jump right up on the stage with you. So、um, that behavior、uh, didn't surprise me. It was very inclusive on many different levels. You know, I don't know. How much acid you've taken, or anything? But there's a certain equalizer、um, where you're just if someone wants to talk or hang out, you're there. But we were not thinking of it as ironic or weird or anything like that at the time. This is just like an adventure for everyone. They just left the place, you know, in their mind and their spirit. They had a wonderful time. It was, and it was good for everybody. I mean, I was totally turned on by the experience. It's one of the best things I've ever been a part of. The guys that I went with and took from our unit, they were fine. They had a good time. Most of the clients that I had with me were fairly paranoid. 
So typically in a large room like that, they'll find an area where they can kind of segregate themselves. So basically, I was spending most of my time in the back of the gym with them, and they were all kind of huddled together. But they were having a good time, but they could only have a good time feeling that they weren't feeling threatened. Other clients, so you can definitely see that, I mean, they're up there, they're engaged. A lot of them were street people living on the streets, picked up on the streets, or they were basically gravely disabled but not being cared for. That was the largest part of the population that they served. So these people, they weren't necessarily out of touch. They were just a little crazy. I mean, these were the lost souls. They're by the grace of God, you know? We could all be in Napa. I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of the other people felt that way. The homeless problem was totally predictable. And in California, it started with Reagan because so many people were cared for in centers and when those centers were shut to them, where are they going to go? There was no safety net. There's nothing for psychiatric patients. So it's most of the people that you see are homeless definitely have psychiatric needs. There's no question about it. The minute he was elected president, um, people were living in cardboard boxes outside my house. That, that was that. But the Napa State Mental Hospital is when people still had a nice, safe, warm place to go. That Cramps concert at Napa was just absolutely a riot, mostly because there was no stardom involved. There was no celebrity involved. There was no I'm better than you involved. And here we were, free citizens of the world, mingling with psychiatric patients who can't leave the grounds. The feeling from Napa was really warm and joyful. You know, even though the music might have been a bit jarring, and I did think of that at the time, um, it, it wasn't. It was fine. People were relaxed and curious. I mean, I, I think someone left with us, to be honest, but I, I'm not for sure what, you know, is imagined and what's not imagined. There was a, a breakout, and a, a bunch of people escaped from the hospital. And there was this one woman, she was basically wearing a nightgown, and she was running down the road. And I stopped, and she jumped in, and we drove back to San Francisco with her. And she became like a, a stalwart in the San Francisco scene. She became like a, you know, a, a respected and loved member of the community. We didn't know, really, when we went to Napa to do that show that it was going to be such an impact on our lives. But we saw something, we learned something, we shared something, and it's still in the universe, it's still doing its job. Napa now is strictly what they call forensic. We don't have psychiatric hospitals basically anymore. They're forensic centers. Forensics meaning you got busted for something, and you're too crazy to be in jail, or you're too crazy to go to trial, or you've gone to trial and you're too crazy to be in a prison. Why in the hell don't we start building facilities, taking over old warehouses, cleaning them up, and helping these people? Why are we leaving them in the streets? Let's have a nice, clean facility and put them all over the damn state, all over the country, and start taking care of people that need help. Yeah, the damage he did to the state was, I mean, for me personally, I saw directly the results of his actions. And his legacy is still here. When you're too sick to be employed, that's it. You know, you find a blue tarp and crawl under it. That's the only choice we give you. And if you do it on public lands, we'll arrest you. And that speaks for all the other politicians ever since then that haven't done a damn thing to change it. I think this is a fault with the, our entire system. Nothing has changed. It's worse now than it's ever been. Every damn governor of the state has not done their job. I mean, that's all there is to it. But just blaming others doesn't do a thing to help solve the problems. I'm willing to put money into it if they raised taxes or whatever. If they needed somebody to serve, uh, you know, a certain amount of volunteer time, I'm ready to do it. Because I just can't stand to see what these people are going through. Hey, look, there's a lot of money rolling around California, especially. So let's take care of something that's really important first. And I think this stands close to number one. You know, so let's get it done. Thank you very much, thank you. You
couldn't have punk rock like that in San Francisco today. Where would you practice? 